I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. Brad Schwartz's new book is Broadcast Hysteria. This is the story of the most famous radio broadcast in all history, Orson Welles' War of the Worlds. We know now that it was a work of fiction based upon H.G. Wells' extremely famous 100-year-old science fiction novel about an invasion of Earth by beings from Mars. At the time, however, they also knew that. That's the joy of Brad's work. Brad, a very good evening to you. The joy of your work is the irony that everybody knew that it was fiction. Everybody understood that this was the Mercury Theater. Everybody understood that Wells was an actor. They all understood that it was Sunday night, October 30th, the night, the mischief night before Halloween. They all knew that. And yet, is it a, is it a surprise to you, and we're going to listen to the opening moments of the broadcast, that people did not record the facts as Wells and his colleagues were giving them. Good evening to you, Brad. Good evening to you. Thank you for having me. Um, I think it's because of the way the show is, is constructed, and you know, we're going to hear um, how well they put it together, because it's so realistic and because of the way people uh, both then and now tend to listen to the, the radio kind of distractedly in some instances. Um, I think it was very easy for people, even who, as you said, maybe had tuned in, knowing that this was uh, Orson Welles or um, if they expected Welles to be on and tuned in a little late and uh, found something that didn't sound like his normal broadcast, I think it was very easy um, for people to get caught up in it in the way that a fraction of his audience uh, did. All right, let's play a game. We'll explain everything you're about to hear afterwards. Brad has very carefully gone through all the elements that you're about to hear. This is four minutes. This is the opening Mercury Theater. It is 8.02 p.m., October 30th, 1938, and on the air is CBS Coast to Coast Radio, the Mercury Theater. Thank 
It is now 8.06 p.m., Sunday, 30 October, 1938. What you've just heard is the opening. Magnificent. Brad, let's first begin with Bernard Herrmann and that awful music. Why was that worked into the broadcast? How was that meant to be part of the storytelling? Well, Wells, uh, Orson Welles, from the very beginning, uh, even before he knew that he wanted to adapt uh, the H.G. Wells novel, The War of the Worlds, wanted to do a show that captured kind of the the immediacy and the excitement and the realism of a breaking news broadcast. He wanted a show that would seem uh, that would make it seem like a crisis was actually happening. Um, and he didn't know what book he wanted to adapt, and one of his producers suggested The War of the Worlds. And key to that, um, key to achieving that effect, was finding a way to draw uh, his audience into the show. Um, they, when they selected The War of the Worlds, uh, I'm not sure that it appears that Wells and, and possibly no one else in his um, production team had ever read the story. They were vaguely familiar with it. Uh, and once um, the writer, Howard Koch, who, who produced the script, The War of the Worlds, uh, put the draft together and, and they saw that it had all this stuff about aliens and, and these science fiction elements, which no, no one took um, particularly credibly uh, at that time. Um, Wells and, and his producer, John Houseman, uh, associate director Paul Stewart, they all kind of had a, a minor panic attack even then because they didn't, they thought our, our listeners aren't going to take this seriously. They're going to tune us out in droves. Nobody will accept this, this crazy science fiction storyline. Um, Wells' show, he was known for doing adaptations of Shakespeare um, and, and G.K. Chesterton and these other kinds of more highbrow in some sense pieces. Um, and this was a, a, very, a departure for them. So in order to uh, make the show seem realistic and to draw listeners into this world, Wells um, had the idea of in, inserting these musical interludes at the very beginning that, that really, as uh, you noticed if you heard it, slow the pace down uh, right from the beginning um, because he realized, and, and Houseman, his producer, uh, uh, feared that this would uh, drive even more listeners away, but Wells realized that if you start kind of slowly uh, and then it gradually speeds up once the, the, the Martians um, get there, uh, listeners will get drawn into it and, and they won't realize that things uh, eventually start happening much too quickly um, and that that it had the intended effect uh, in more ways than one for those listeners who uh, did not realize that this was a fictional program. Um, they were drawn into it. Uh, oftentimes, I, I, I went through many, um, uh, nearly 2,000 letters as part of the research for the book that people who heard the show wrote to Wells and the FCC describing their experiences. And out of the um, few hundred from people who had been frightened, Many times people talk about how they had tuned on the radio, as you said, you know, Sunday evening, uh, the time to relax. A lot of people wanted uh, music uh, to listen to. And this Bernard Herrmann's um, uh, rendition of these, these dance pieces, even though it, it's quite terrible and he doesn't really understand the rhythm. Uh, he was a classically trained musician. He doesn't understand the rhythm of dance pieces. Uh, but he, um, nevertheless, it was good enough for some listeners uh, and they started listening, and when these announcements um, uh, about these explosions on Mars uh, interrupt the, the, the news bra or the, uh, music, they just went with it, because this was a time, um, it's about a month after the, uh, the Czechoslovakian diplomatic crisis, where, where Hitler um, brought the world to the brink of, of, of another world war, um, and people in the United States in particular had gotten used to hearing these late-breaking news bulletins reporting on uh, the uh, developments overseas. And so to have a uh, musical program like this interrupted with a, a, you know, ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt this to bring you a special bulletin, that uh, then, as now, makes people prick up their ears and uh, listen a little more, more closely. I'm speaking with Bra broadcast hysteria author Brad Schwartz. When we come back, we're going to go to more of the broadcast on... Uh, on October 30th and explicate more of how Wells and Hausman and Koch and the others put together the most famous radio broadcast of all in 1938. Notice that. He says the 39th year of the 20th century. This was always fiction, but people hear according to the context. And in 1938, there was great drama. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show.
And John Batchelor, this is the John Batchelor Show. Brad Schwartz's new book is Broadcast Hysteria. It's the story of Orson Welles and John Houseman and Howard Koch and Bernard Herrmann and others at Mercury Theater, CBS, National Broadcasting, October 30th, 1938, part of a series of presentations by Mercury Theater. Mercury Theater did not dominate the airwaves. This was a very bad time for anyone to get... Uh, get exposure in America because they were opposite Charlie McCarthy, the very famous Jason Sanborn hour that everybody listened to. In fact, uh, Brad, uh, in his book, developed statistics that show that the audience for Wells was very small. We all know, of course, that there were 45 million people at Woodstock in 1969. That's how a famous incident goes. Everybody has a version that puts them in the moment. This is not the case from stats, but let's go to how it is that Wells and Hausman and Koch imagined it as they're approaching this. First of all, uh, Brad, John Hausman, born 1902. How did he team up with Orson Wells, born 1915? Well, Hausman uh, had a very unusual background. He was from Romania, uh, and he kind of traveled around Europe as a child, eventually wound up in the United States working as a grain merchant in the 20s. Uh, until the, the stock market crash happened and he lost his business and his work visa, that he decided to remain uh, in the U.S. illegally and pursue a love of the arts, which was what he'd always secretly wanted to do. Uh, and he worked in Hollywood, he wrote a few plays, and eventually he got um, caught up in the, the Federal Theater Project, which was part of uh, FDR's Works Progress Administration. Um, you know, it was a, a, a work uh, relief program meant to uh, uh, employ out-of-work stagehands and actors and things like that, but for uh, people like Hausman and others involved in the art in New York at that time, it became an opportunity to um, to really do some some innovative and daring theater. And uh, Hausman um, specifically had gone to see a, a production of Romeo and Juliet uh, in New York, a traveling company uh, production uh, with a young Orson Welles in the role. Welles. Um, had uh, come out of uh, the, the uh, Todd School for Boys in Woodstock, Illinois, where he had uh, developed his, his love of the arts and done some of his first uh, stage productions or, you know, directed them as, as a student. And he, he traveled quite a bit. He'd, he'd been on the Dublin stage, um, and he kind of hit a lull in his career. He's only uh, 19, I think, at the time. Um, and Houseman immediately uh, saw him, uh, saw his potential, that he had this great voice, he had this great personality, um, and Hausman uh, decided that you know he had to find something to to work with this with this young man on, and they they collaborated on a a very prophetically named play, uh, Panic, by the poet Archibald McLeish, which was about the the 1932 bank crisis. Um, and then when Hausman uh, winds up in the WPA, specifically working for um, the the wing of the Federal Theater Project meant to employ African American uh, artists, uh, the Negro Theater. Uh, he needs a director, and who does he decide to call? Orson Welles. And so they, they produce this very famous uh, adaptation of Shakespeare's Macbeth, a uh, set in Haiti, uh, with kind of a voodoo aesthetic that uh, gets well in all the papers, and he, he's 21, I think, at the time, or just turning 21. Um, and that's what kind of puts him on the map. Uh, and from that, they get their own um, uh, theatrical company within the WPA uh, and produce several... Uh, innovative plays leading up to the very famous uh, The Cradle Will Rock, which uh, the Federal Theater Project tried to shut down on opening day, uh, and Wells and Houseman and their company famously uh, wouldn't stand for that, and so they, they took the troupe to an empty theater across town and performed in the aisles, and that became a sensation, and from that, uh, the publicity they got from that allowed them to form their own Mercury uh, yeah. Theater. That's June of 37, June 16, 37, The Cradle Will Rock. That makes all the newspapers, and that gives CBS the idea to give Houseman and, and Wells the Mercury Theater, what becomes the Mercury Theater, on air. They're originally given 9 p.m. at night on a Monday night, which is a great hour, and they don't know what to do with it, or they mishandle it because Wells is Tony. And what is radio at the time rewards the least common denominator. It's television without the pictures in 1937, 1938. A detail here, Orson Welles is a wunderkind. I understand that. And Hausman's relationship to Welles is critical here. 
it is it a father son relationship is it older brother uh, and younger brother how would you characterize it brad brad uh both both and neither uh houseman in his memoirs talks quite a bit about how you know he was uh, as you said significantly older um than orson wells but at the same time wells was much more experienced in the ways of the theater than houseman was and certainly much more charismatic he was a natural at this um and and projected that there's the famous quote i don't remember who who said it that uh you know wells uh knew that he was exactly what he would like to be if, if God had consulted him on the subject. You know, he was very confident. And Hausman, who wanted to to be um, to be in the theater and to be in the orbit of someone like Orson Welles, uh, dis- uh, resolved to essentially help Welles uh, do what he did best by, by dealing with all of the, uh, you know, the managerial duties and the, the money stuff. And, and, and uh, Hausman really kept the wheels of the Mercury Theater running uh, which was always a challenging job because they were always running out of money and always getting in trouble and always at the brink of prices. Um, but Houseman protected Wells in that in that way so Wells could, could create and do what he did best. And their their relationship was um, very uh, very productive but very turbulent and, and flamed out uh, very quickly uh, around the production of uh, or the, uh, yes. One of the ways that uh, Hausman managed the Mercury Theater to save money was to hire a hard scrabble playwright, Howard Koch, for $75 a week to work six days a week to rewrite everything in six hours. And it's Koch, Howard Koch, who becomes the author of the adaption of War of the Worlds that we're featuring here. Uh, Wells later on will be very cherry about giving credit to anyone but himself once he escapes the the dramatic attention that war that war of the worlds gains in 1938-39 when we come back we're going to listen to more of the broadcast the book is broadcast hysteria brad schwartz is the author i'm john bachelor John Batchelor, this is the John Batchelor Show. Brad Schwartz's new book is Broadcast Hysteria. It's the story of Orson Welles, John Hausman, Howard Koch, Bernard Herrmann, and others. They're broadcast October 30th, 1938, to an American audience that's indifferent at the time, but quickly builds a great fascination with what has happened to this new medium, radio. Made radio still forming rules for itself. How you give news reports, how to be clear about what is fiction, what is fact, how to break in, use the word flash. We'll hear all that in this Wells broadcast, putting this all together, also taking advantage of the fact that mostly they're playing orchestral music, which is somnambulant and not very expensive to produce. And in this particular broadcast, War of the Worlds, they break into an orchestra that they faked in order to make it look like it's a normal broadcasting hour with news flashes coming in. We're next going to hear another detail that was used in this broadcast. This is when a someone who was introduced as the Secretary of the Interior, Secretary of the Interior now, uses a sonorous, pompous voice associated with government at the time. It was new for government, for the federal government, for FDR to use radio, the fireside chats. You will hear his voice, and this also is an indiscretion at the time because they do not make it clear that this is not official. 
It is now 8.30 p.m., October 30th, 1938, midway through the broadcast. Uh, Brad, why the Secretary of the Interior? Why was that important to the critics of this broadcast? And how was that changed by me, uh, by the broadcast medium afterwards? Um, well, the, the reason it's the Secretary of the Interior is because uh, for most shows at the time, it was uh, against network policy to impersonate the President of the United States. I mean, as you said, you know, radio... Uh, it's all words, no visuals, right? And, and it's much easier to manipulate or, or impersonate someone's voice when you can't see who's doing the impression um, and, and deceive someone in that way um, than it is when you have the visual element. It, you know, it's much clearer that the eye is, is easier to, or is harder to fool than the ear in a lot of ways. And people and networks at the time feared that if you had someone uh, claiming to be a government official or the president of the United States on the air, um, at the People would would uh, believe that to be true, and more of the world um, uh, proves this in, in some some fashion. Um, the initial, the early script drafts uh, have that speech um, that you played uh, an early draft, an early form of it, um, uh, but it's attributed to the Secretary of War, and then it, it disappears from uh, the finished, the final draft script that uh, they used when they when they went on the air. I believe um, it's a supposition, but I believe. It was because of the, uh, the, the network, uh, the lawyers had to go over it and approve everything, and they, they probably said you can't do the Secretary of War, so they cut it. Um, and they'd made other very similar changes of that kind. Uh, but when Wells, um, on the day of the show, when he really becomes involved with the broadcast and starts changing things in the script, um, he puts it back in and reassigns it to what is a less alarming uh, cabinet official in some sense, the Secretary of the Interior. But he does this very... Uh, clever and, and, and uh, irresponsible in some way thing, um, which is he has uh, Kenny Delmar, the actor playing that role, um, read those lines uh, in the voice of President Roosevelt, which was a voice, as you said, that was very familiar to Americans in the 1930s from Roosevelt's fireside chat. Uh, you know, he had, Roosevelt um, used the, the mass communication much more effectively than any president before him had done. He knew how to connect with people um, through this medium. And the, uh, the, his, his speeches oftentimes had great impact on, on policy and how uh, uh, people interpreted current events. So his voice had a very uh, special power to it um, and, and, and was very familiar to, to Americans at the time. And so when Wells kind of uh, uh, counterfeits it, or has Kenny Delmar counterfeit it, uh, for some, some people who were listening to the show, uh, said, even though, you know, it's clearly not the Secretary of the Interior, some people did believe they were doing a presidential address. But more, um, you know, of the, the fraction of the audience that were frightened, um, even, you know, uh, many people wrote in their letters that, you know, they knew that it was the Secretary of the Interior, and some people even complained to the real Secretary of the Interior, um, saying that they were using your authority. Uh, but it was simply the, the authority of that office that sort of, this was not, you know, um, the notion that you could go on, on the air and pretend to be a cabinet official uh, was, was very new at that time. And people, uh, and, and this is, you know, the, the show mentions the New Jersey militia, the Red Cross, all these various institutions. And Americans, or at least those who, who tuned in late, uh, assumed that you couldn't use those kinds of authorities uh, if you weren't those authorities. And that those those um, institutional references, more than really any other element of the show, was what convinced some people that uh, the broadcast was, was a real news. Also, program. recall now, a very small number of people compared to the size of the audience are listening to this in the original. There is a game of whispering a word around a circle at a birthday party and comes back very strange. That's what will happen to this. I'm sure that everybody understands if you hear the Secretary of the Interior, you're going to challenge. He's talking about the enemy. But by the 15th time that's retold, it's going to become the President of the World. Now we'll hear another element that was used in the 38 broadcast that is uh, antique to us. But at the time, the presumption was the bomber always gets through. The bomber is the weapon that will stop the next war. The bomber is so effective you can't defend against na against poison gas. That was the lesson of the first war. Everybody was certain that the second war would be the end of humanity because cities would be reduced to ash. We're going to use the bomber and gas now 
The Martians are the enemy, but you can forget that quickly because of the war fever that is still hanging over Europe uh, very wisely because war is about to begin next August. Uh, and August 39 is when the world war begins that destroys 75 million people. So everybody's right to be frightened. Here are the bombers. Army bombing plane V-843 off Bayonne, New Jersey. Lieutenant Vogt, commanding eight bombers, reporting to Commander Fairfax Langham Field. This is Vogt reporting to Commander Fairfax Langham Field. Enemy tripod machines now in sight. Reinforced by three machines from the Marstown Cylinder. Six altogether. One machine partially crippled. Believed hit by shell from Army gun in Wachung Mountains. Guns now appear silent. A heavy black fog hanging close to the earth of extreme density, nature unknown. No sign of heat ray. Enemy now turns east, crossing Passaic River into the Jersey marshes. Another straddles the Pulaski Skyway. Evident objective is New York City. New York City. Brad, did people run in the streets because that was the story told by the newspapers afterwards? Um, in very rare instances, what I discovered from, from looking at letters and, and press accounts, um, very early on in my research, I noted that some of the most, the, 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 the most extreme instances of hysteria that I found, where you had people running in the streets and, and, and doing all that stuff that come down to us through popular culture, many of the most extreme examples of that came from college campuses. And I started to wonder, why would this be? And eventually I realized that it's because you have uh, on a college campus a concentration of people um, often living in, in a dormitory or some kind of institutionalized housing, and all it takes is one person to tune in late uh, and mishear the broadcast and then run and tell five people who run and tell five people who run and tell five people, and it goes viral. Um, and in those kinds of circumstances, when you know, you're surrounded by 20 or 30 people who maybe haven't even heard the, the show themselves, but are all convinced that something uh, horrible is happening, and they don't know what it is. Maybe some think it's Martians. Most um, apparently believed it was some kind of uh, natural disaster or a German invasion, because as you said, you know, uh, the Second World War is less than a year away. Um, uh, so in that kind of circumstance, when you're surrounded by fear and belief, um, it's only natural that you would that you would believe it too. And once I noticed that pattern on college campuses. Uh, I began to see it in kind of dense urban neighborhoods, apartment buildings. Um, those those pockets of hysteria uh, are what we uh, have come to call the world, the world's panic. And the running, you know, to and fro that the newspapers reported, uh, in most cases, seems to have been this kind of desire to spread the word. Because it's true today. Whenever we hear uh, alarming or momentous news, our first impulse generally is to spread it tell somebody we don't want to experience these kinds of things um, uh, by ourselves. And so that, that caused these, these isolated pockets of hysteria across the country. But um, it was localized. So unless you were in the center of it, uh, the vast majority of uh, Americans that night had absolutely no idea that anything was going on. And the mistake uh, that the American press made uh, was to kind of connect the dots uh, and and characterize this as a wave of mass hysteria when really it was uh, isolated, scattered, um, pretty small um, instances. But it did, it did happen uh, on, that, on that level. I'm speaking with Brad Schwartz. His new book is Broadcast Hysteria. We're going to go to the defense by Orson Welles when we come back, the day after. I mentioned, consistent with what Brad just reasoned about the hysteria, on the day of the attack, 9-11-2001, I was at the library writing and within 10 minutes of the second plane hitting the aircraft, I got a, fall, a call from Washington, and the words were very brief. This is an attack. That's what happened. Now, that was an accurate report, but you can understand how it could quickly spread if it was an inaccurate report. When we come back, Wells Under Attack. Broadcast Hysteria is the book. I'm John Batchelor. <laughs> 
I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. Brad Schwartz's new book is Broadcast Hysteria. Orson Welles, the most famous of all radio broadcasts, 1938, October 30th, the night before Halloween, 1938, with war fever in Europe, with threats from the Third Reich. There had been a hurricane that had swept through New England in September, the month before, and so bulletins were fresh to everybody's ear. Listen, there's bad weather, there are bad, there, there's bad news, there could be an attack. However, Wells, to his credit, finishes the broadcast. We'll listen to the last minute. He very clearly explains to anybody who's listening that this was fiction about Halloween. It is 9 p.m., Sunday, October 30th, 1938. You cannot mistake what you, were just he- what you just heard, except they did. Brad, within moments, in fact, during the broadcast, they knew that there was an uh, upset. They knew that, uh, th- that things were going to go badly. The police arrive, and they start hiding the scripts. Why? Right. Um, well, the, the police, the reason the police showed up was because uh, these calls started pouring in to... Uh, CBS and to police stations and newspaper offices from people who are trying to verify uh, these reports. That was the first impulse that many people had. And they didn't have, you know, today I think we would pull up Google on our phones and, and, and search for the news, but the best they could do in those days was call an authority. Um, and so the police are suddenly bombarded by all these calls uh, about a radio show. They don't know what's going on. Uh, so they send in uh, these, these officers to CBS to try and figure out what's happening. And later, um, an angry listener called in a bomb threat, so then more police showed up. Uh, and so Wells is in the in the uh, the studio, and he can see through the, the control room window uh, these, these blue uniformed people coming in and looking at him as he's still performing the show. Um, and he, to his credit, you know, keeps the show must go on. He maintains his composure and keeps going, but he has no idea, you know, does he, does he think he's going to be arrested? Does, does he think people have died? He, you know, he has he has no no sense really of the effect of it beyond that something horrible has happened. And Houseman, in the control room as well, has um, uh, learned from the, the the network executive that they're getting all these calls and there are these rumors of, of injuries, of mass stampedes, and possible suicides. All of this this stuff that never really panned out. Um, there are no deaths definitively tied um, to War of the Worlds, and only one or two minor injuries. Let's listen to Orson Welles defend himself October 31st, the next day. This is a press conference, audio and video. He was on camera and listened to Welles very carefully perform what you'd have to say apologetically. It's quite arch. Here it is. Yes. The camera. We've asked you that uh, before. Ask loud, uh, loud. Do you think, Mr. Wells, that you might have taken unfair advantage of the public in using a method as a conveyance for authentic news? I don't believe that I have since it is not a method original with me. It is used by many radio programs. Uh, I am terribly shocked by the effect it's had. I do not believe that the method is original with me or, or peculiar to the Mercury Theater's presentation. Do you think there ought to be a law uh, against such uh, enactments as we had last night or is it all of that? I don't know what the legislation would be. 
I know that almost everybody in radio would do almost anything to avert the kind of thing that has happened, uh -huh. myself included, but I, uh, I don't know what the legislation would be. We simply, radio is new and we are learning about the effect it has on people. We learned a terrible lesson. Will, do you think that this will cause uh, the curbing of uh, radio bulletins on the air today? I simply can't imagine. It seems to me that uh, the effects of this will may have uh, may cause much legislation. I don't. I simply don't know. It's, it, it's the wisdom of uh, of radio executives and of uh, of an organized public will decide these things for us. Oh, Brad, you can hear him. Wells becomes the most famous man on the uni in the universe for about twenty four hours, doesn't he? And it uh, it goes on from there. I mean, this is the the moment that uh, catapults into stardom and makes Citizen Kane and everything else. And he knows yeah. it. He knows it. I can hear it in his performance. He's hamming it up as if he's apologetic. Anyone in radio would die to reproduce those <laughs> those results. That is true. Although I mean, at the time, you know, as I said, even even uh, that morning, he didn't. There was still the possibility that you know legal prosecution that there sure. were deaths and injuries. So he's being very careful. He, he walks it brilliantly. He walks a very fine line because on the one hand, he has to uh, say that, you know, we're, we're shocked and we can't believe that the show had this effect. But on the other hand, he can't say that the people who fell for it are dumb, right? Because they're already upset at him already. So he, he, he equivocates and kind of says, well, we never expected this, but you can't always know what effect it's going to have. You don't know how the audience is going to respond. Um, so it's a very it's a very careful performance, but I think he knew that his career and and possibly his life were on the line. John House, John Houseman, Orson Welles, Bernard Herman, everyone there went on to a wonderful.